Hey, welcome to episode 28 of the Undiscovered Games video podcast, where we take a look at the lesser known board games of the world and share those with you. We're going back to 2004 today with a very unknown game called Submarine. This was designed by Leo Colovini with beautiful artwork from Michael Menzel. Colovini, Menzel, those are two of my favorite names in the industry. And when I found out they worked on this game almost 20 years ago, I got very excited because I had never heard about this game until very recently when this kind YouTuber, commented on my Hector and Achilles videos. Thank you for that comment. You put Submarine on my radar, and I guess I should say you put it on my sonar, because we're going to be going below the ocean surface to try to collect sunken treasure. So everybody has these little cool wooden submarines, and you're going to be sending these out and trying to collect these treasure tiles faster than your opponents. This game is a race to fill up your card here full of these different treasure tiles. You're trying to collect one of every treasure. The first player to do that is going to win the game. Now that sounds like a simple idea. But this is one of those games that's quite deceiving because when you first learn it, when you first see how it plays, it seems very, very simple. But I promise you, this game has a ton of interesting depth to explore. For example, you have to figure out how to pace yourself against your opponents. This game has a player-driven pace, so it's all about where your opponents are, knowing when to go for certain tiles or when to reposition yourself and get in a better area. It almost feels like area control where you're jockeying for position on the board, but it's not really area control. It's more more of a set collection and it uses like a closed economy with your cards. Your cards are basically currency in the game. You have to spend cards to collect these tiles, but you also have to pay cards to other players if they're in the same area as you. So you can kind of use that to get in each other's way. It's a very interactive type of game in that regard. And even though the game is a little bit more abstracted, it looks really cool on the table and the visuals really add to the flavor. Like I'm glad that it has this good visual because otherwise it might feel kind of dry or abstract. I love how the little submarines sort of start near the top of the surface and they work their way down over the course of the game and it even makes it harder to get to the bottom of the ocean. Those tiles on the bottom become harder to get and they're more expensive because you have to pay everybody that's directly above you in that same column and I'll get to all that in the video but I'm just saying I really like the aesthetics here because they add something nice to a more abstract idea. So very nice production here from Rio Grande and winning moves like I said this is from 2004 so almost 20 years ago now and for as small of a box as this is it packs quite a punch and it looks beautiful on the table you know the board really sprawls out it's a beautifully illustrated board as to be expected from Michael Menzel and the tiles and the little wooden boats and everything just looks great on the table so I really like the production value especially for a game this old very interesting and tricky game to master so let me teach you how to play this game it's pretty easy to learn and teach each once you see how it works. The very first thing you're going to want to do before you set up the game is take the cards and take three of each color card and just store those in the box, put them in a separate bag or something. You only need 60 cards, but the game comes with 75 in case you lose some or damage some. So it comes with three extra cards in each color. So just store those separately. The rule book doesn't really explain that, and it's important because you have to have a proper distribution of colors throughout this deck. So just make sure you separate those cards out. Now, find the 60 treasure tiles, and then you're going to find these five seashell tiles here. These seashells are called jokers or wilds. Those stay off to the side, but you're going to take the other tiles and mix them all together in a bag or in the box lid or something, and you're going to seed the board randomly with these treasure tiles. The way it works is this row here, each square gets one tile placed randomly. Then this next row gets two tiles in each square. The next row gets three tiles in each square, and the bottom row gets four tiles in each square square. So it's very easy to remember that part of setup because you always use all 60 tiles. It doesn't matter how many players are playing the game. Next, each player chooses a player color. Uh, there's five different colors to choose from here. We have gray, white, brown, black, and pink. So whatever color you choose, you take your stuff that matches your color. We have a player board here. Each player takes a player board. All these player boards are the same, by the way. They don't change like from one color to the next. So everybody gets the same player board. And then you're going to take a certain number of these smaller submarines based on the player count. So if you're playing this game with two or three players, you use all five of your submarines. But if you play with four players, you're only going to use four of your submarines. And if you play with five players, you only get to use three of your submarines and put the rest back in the box. Now each player is going to get their starting supply of cards. These are dealt face down at random to the players and it's based on player count. So if you're playing with two or three players, each player starts with 15 cards dealt face down at random. If you're playing with four players, each player starts with 13 cards 
cards, and if you play with five players, each player gets 12 cards to start the game. Now, the way to distribute the cards, um, the rulebook says you can do this either way. So you could either shuffle the deck first, deal out the starting cards, and then just put the rest back in the box. The problem is, if you do it that way, there's a chance that the cards that go back in the box might be all the same color, and that will severely skew the color distribution throughout the entire deck. So what the rulebook says you could do is remove the cards first, then shuffle the deck and deal them out. And I would recommend doing that because then you can ensure that a fairly even number of colors gets removed from the game. For example, in a three-player game, each player starts with 15 cards. So you're going to use 45 of the 60 cards. So there's going to be 15 cards that you don't use. Just take out three of each color. Because five colors, three of each color is your 15 cards. Now in a four-player game, you're going to use 52 cards out of the 60, which means you'll have eight left over. Obviously, you can't evenly distribute that, but you can at least you know make sure you have one of each color and then three other colors or something, just so you don't have all the same color being removed from the game. So that's the setup. Each player takes their starting supply of cards. You can shuffle your starting supply, just keep them face down, and then each player draws the top three cards from their supply. This is your starting hand. You're always going to bring your hand back up to three cards at the end of your turn. So you're only going to have three cards in your hand at any given point throughout the game. Take these shell tiles that we set aside at the beginning of the game, mix them up in your hand or something, and randomly give one to each player. These are joker tiles. These are kept off to the side of your player board, but each player starts with one, and any leftovers go back in the box. The final part of setup is to place your submarines out on this first row of the board. Now notice here, we have a row up top above the surface. This is reserved for your recovery ships. These are going to be floating on the surface of the ocean up here, and then your submarines can go on any of these spots below the ocean surface. So before we start the game, we have to seed the board with our submarines, and they all start on this very first row here below the surface. So you have to choose a starting player, however you see fit, and then you take turns one at a time going around the table clockwise and just placing one submarine at a time on any of these squares in this first row. So starting with the starting player, they place one submarine out, then the next player goes in clockwise order, place one submarine out, and so on. You just keep doing this around the table until everybody places all their submarines. There's no limit as to how many submarines can be on a certain square. You could come back and put your next submarine on the same square as you put your first submarine and just keep putting them on the same square. It does not matter as long as it's in this first row. Once everybody has placed all their submarines to start, now you just take your recovery ship and place that off the board to the left of this top row here. The recovery ships move from left to right across the surface here, but you start off the board to the left. And now you're ready to play the game. Game. Starting with the start player, you're going to take individual turns going clockwise around the table. An individual turn consists of two steps. It's very simple. The very first part of your turn is you must move your recovery ship at least one space to the right. Again, we start off the board here, so the very first move could be onto this first space here or as far to the right as you want. The only rule is wherever you decide to stop, you must have at least one of your submarines directly below that recovery ship. So for purple's first move here, they could not move their boat here because they do not have any purple submarines directly underneath of it. But for Purple's first turn, they could move their boat here, or they could move their boat all the way over here, or they could move their boat clear over here if they wanted to. And then wherever they stop, now they activate all their submarines directly underneath. Just remember, your recovery ship stays in this top row, and it only moves left to right. Once you move your boat off the edge of the board, you have to wait until all the other players move their boats off the edge of the board before you'll get a turn again. And I'll go over that in a minute. So let's say Purple moves here for their first turn. They stop their recovery ship, and then they activate all their purple submarines directly underneath their recovery ship. And I'm going to say right now, the rule book calls your submarines bathyscapes or bathyscaps. I have never heard this term. I had to Google it to even learn what it meant or how to say it. I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly, but just know when I say submarines, I'm referring to what the rule book calls bathyscapes. So I just don't want to say that for the entire tutorial. So we're going to call them submarines. Anyway, purple stops their movement. Now they activate these submarines. Submarines. When you activate a submarine, you have a choice. You can either move it or collect treasure where it already is. You cannot do both. But if you activate multiple submarines, you can use each of them individually. So you could move one submarine, but then you could use the other submarine to collect treasure. It's just you can't move a submarine and then collect treasure with that same submarine in the same turn. The rule 
is you must activate at least one of your submarines. So if you had like four submarines directly under this recovery ship, you couldn't just be like, I'm going to stop and not activate any of them. You have to do one of the things at least, but you could activate all four. And again, activating means you either move it or you collect treasure. So let's first go over the rules for moving your submarine. Moving is very free and open here. You can go to any space in the row that it's in or any space in the row above or below where it already is. Now in this example, it could not go above because the submarines never go above into this top row where the recovery ships go, but it could go to any space in the row that it's in or it could go to any space in the row directly below it, but not down here. Now let's say Purple decides to move their sub over here. Now on a later turn, when they move this recovery ship again, they'll activate this sub again. They could move it in any space in this row, this row, or this row. So this is kind of how you work your way down to the lower depths of the ocean. Anyway, that's all the rules for moving. Now, instead of moving, you could choose to collect treasure. The way this works is if your sub is on a square that has treasure tiles available, then you simply just play cards from your hand that match the colors of the treasures that are there that you want to collect. So let's set up an example here. Let's say it was like this and purple first moves the recovery ship here. Now they can activate all these subs that are directly below it. So let's say with this sub here, they want to move. Let's say they move it up and over to here. Now let's say with this sub, they want to collect treasure. Now you can collect as much treasure as you want from one sub. You just have to have the cards to match. So here we have a red tile, a blue tile, and a green tile. But in my hand, I have two green cards and a blue card. So in this example, I could play a green card and a blue card to take the green and the blue tile. You take those tiles and you place them on your player board on the matching space. If you already have a tile with that same symbol, this becomes a wild or a joker tile. Remember we start the game with these seashell tiles. These are also jokers. Well, this is how you can get more joker tiles. You get duplicates of the same symbol. So if I already have this on my board, this just goes off to the side and becomes a joker tile. And I'll talk more about joker tiles here later. But if there's an open space on your board, the tile goes there. Now here's the catch. When you collect treasure tiles from the board, you also have to pay opponents that are in the same square as you, as well as any opponents directly above you in that same column. And the way it works is for each treasure tile you collect, you have to pay one card from your supply, from your face down supply here, to that opponent per tile you collect. So in this example, white has their boat here, and white has another boat up here, and black has a boat up here. So in this example, if I'm the purple player and I buy two treasures from this spot here, I have to pay white four cards, two for this submarine and then two more for this submarine. Again, it's one card per tile per sub. Black would get two cards from me then. So I'd have to pay out six cards here. Those cards come off the top of this deck here. They stay face down and they go on to the deck of my opponents face down. So you don't know exactly which cards you're giving them. They don't know which card they're getting in return, but cards are a very valuable currency in this game. And you really have to weigh, you know, how many cards you want to, to get rid of because you're spending cards to match the colors of the tiles, but then you're also spending cards to the other players. Now it's important to note, if you do not have enough cards to pay your opponents, you are not allowed to collect the treasure tiles. So you have to have enough cards to pay for the treasure tiles and every opponent that's there or directly above you. It's also important to note that if your deck ever runs out and you still need to pay opponents, you can pay cards from your hand at that point. But like I said, if you don't have enough cards in your deck or your hand, then you cannot spend cards to collect the tiles. Now you could still use Joker tiles, which I'm gonna talk about in the next segment, but there's one more thing I'm gonna cover here when you're paying other players cards. Let's say you paid an opponent and they were down to like only one card in their hand. That's all they had left, but you paid them some cards. They would be allowed to immediately draw up to have a hand of three cards at that point. So you are always allowed to have a hand of three cards if possible in this game. That's just a little side note in the rule book. At the end of your turn, after you do 
all your submarine actions, that's when you refill your hand back up to three cards from your personal stack. If you don't have enough in your personal stack, just refill what you can. So this can be a very unforgiving game if you don't pace yourself properly. If you run out of cards, then your whole strategy is moving your subs in position to try to block other players and get them to pay you cards. And you can use that strategy even when you don't run out of cards. It's a very interesting part of the game, one of my favorite parts actually. So you have to really weigh how much you want to buy a tile or if you just want to push ahead and try to get in a better position so you don't have to pay as many cards, you really have to weigh those decisions. Anyway, taking tiles from the board uh, by paying cards of the same color and then also paying opponents that are in the same spot as you as well as directly above you. Now any opponents directly below you, you don't have to pay them anything. Now let's talk about these joker tiles. So anytime, like I said, anytime you get a duplicate of the same symbol, it becomes a joker or a wild. You also start the game with these seashells, which are always wild. When you go to collect treasure with your submarines, instead of spending cards, you can spend joker tiles one to one. So if I want to collect a treasure and I don't want to spend a card, I can instead spend a joker tile to the board and then take another tile and return from that same space. The colors do not have to match in this case. So in this example, I have my yellow seashell, that's always a joker, and then I have my duplicate sword here, which is red. See, I already had a sword on my board, so when I got this sword, it was a duplicate, so it became a joker. So I have two joker tiles to spend. I can spend these to the space I'm on and take two other tiles from that space. And the colors are irrelevant, so I could take these two blue tiles, bring them back onto my board, and leave these out there. Once these are out there, then another player could come in and get these tiles following the normal rules rules, you know, spending the proper color cards or spending joker tiles. So there's a neat little economy going on here between uh, spending cards to get tiles or spending tiles to get tiles. Now, when you spend tiles to get tiles, you do not have to pay any other players cards or tiles or anything. So it's a free move and that creates an awesome little incentive to go for duplicate symbols. Even though the whole goal of the game is to fill up your card with unique symbols, it creates a really fun incentive to get duplicates because those joker tiles come in handy especially because your cards are so limited you don't want to have to spend a bunch of cards when you're collecting these tiles which brings up another point let's say this was the setup here and i wanted to buy all three of these tiles i could choose to buy one tile with a card so let's say i buy the blue tile with my card and then i buy the other two tiles with my joker tiles now i'm only required to pay my opponents for the tile that i bought with the card so in this example, if I'm the purple player, I have to pay brown one card, I have to pay white two cards, one for this boat and one for this boat. But again, I only bought one tile with a card, so I don't have to pay one card out per opponent that's there. Whereas if I would have used cards to buy all three of these tiles, then all of a sudden I would have to pay brown three cards and white six cards. So you can really save yourself by using these joker tiles. Another nice thing about the joker tiles is those allow you to get maybe more than three treasures in a single turn. Because remember, you have a hand of three cards. You're only going to be able to buy three treasures in a single turn with your cards. But if you have some joker tiles stored up, you could unleash a huge turn if you lined up all your subs and then you bought like a bunch of treasure tiles, you know, using joker tiles or cards or both. So you could sort of use the joker tiles to pace and save up for a big turn later and just all of a sudden unleash this monster turn that your opponents didn't see coming. So again, really, really like the incentive to get duplicates in this game, even though it contradicts the entire idea on how to win the game, which is to get unique symbols. Now, it's worth noting that you can never choose to make a tile into a joker. So if you have an empty space on your board, you have to put the tile on the empty space. It only becomes a joker when you already have that space filled up, you get a duplicate symbol, then it becomes a joker. So I don't know that you would ever want to do that, but it is worth noting that you can't choose to keep a tile off your board. You must always fill up your board first and then if you get any duplicates, those become the jokers. So you're always trying to weigh, you know, do I go after a duplicate just to get more jokers in my possession, kind of build up my supply of jokers for later in the game or do I just take what I can get, spend my cards and get all these symbols before my opponents do it? Because again, if the game ends before anybody fills their card up, the winner is going to be whoever has their board filled up the most with unique symbols. So you definitely 
probably need to stay in the hunt. You don't want to hang back too much and build up a bunch of jokers because the game could end in one of three ways. First of all, if a player obviously gets their board full, they win immediately. But there's two other ways the game could end too. First, if one of these columns on the game board is completely empty, has no more tiles in it, then the game ends immediately and whoever has their board filled up the most is going to be the winner. If it's a tie, it's whoever has more joker tiles left over. And if it's still a tie, whoever has more cards left in their supply or their hand becomes the winner. Another way the game could end is if all the cards get spent. So if all players run out of all of their cards, the game ends immediately and then whoever has their board filled up the most wins the game at that point. If it's a tie, then whoever has more joker tiles left over will be the winner. So again, it's the first to fill up their board or whoever has their board the most full when either a column goes empty out of tiles or all these cards get spent and nobody has any cards left. And one quick thing I forgot to mention is if a column only has the seashell jokers left, so it's empty except for seashell joker tiles, that is considered an empty column, which would trigger the end of the game. There's one more rule to go over, and that is with your recovery ship. Uh, remember I said if you reach the end of the board, you have to always move it to the right. Well, eventually you're going to run off the edge of the board. When you run off the edge of the board, you are not allowed to do your submarine actions. Instead, what you can do is swap a card if you want. You take one card out of your hand, place it on the bottom of your deck, and draw the top card. Then it would go to the next player. They would move their recovery ship, do their actions. The next player, move their recovery ship, do their actions. Then if it gets back to me, if there's still players doing their actions, I have to wait another turn. So now I could swap another card if I wanted to, take it to the bottom of my deck, and draw another one. So you do get something to do while you wait, but you have to wait there until all these players move their boats off the edge of the board. Each time it's your turn, you have the option of swapping a card while you wait. As soon as that last player moves their boat off the edge of the board, I mean, they would have the option to swap cards, but then all these boats come back over here and reset, and then the next player must move their boat back onto the board and do the regular actions. So if you go too far, too fast, you're going to be stuck over here waiting and just swapping cards. So you have to pace yourself well in this game, both with your recovery ship up top and with your cards that you're spending throughout the game. You don't want to spend too many cards. Very nice balancing act there. Very nice push and pull between the players, sort of trying to uh, jockey for position, getting good spots so that you can buy the tiles you want without having to pay too many cards to your opponent. It's a very nice little tightrope to walk, and I really like the way this game does it. So I think I covered all the rules for submarine. I just wanted to hammer home a few rules that are maybe easy to forget or something like that. Um, when you move your recovery ship, just remember you have to move it onto a space that has at least one of your submarines directly below it. So you cannot move onto a column where none of your submarines exist because the rule is you must activate at least one of your submarines. So if you move here and you have three submarines, you can activate one, you can activate two, or you can activate all three of them. But you can't choose to activate none of them. Again, activating a submarine is either moving it or collecting tiles. Another thing to remember is you can collect as many tiles as you want or can with a single submarine, as long as those tiles are on the same space as your submarine, and as long as you have enough cards or tiles to pay for that. The last thing I want to clarify is just regarding the color of the tiles that you collect. That is completely irrelevant to winning the game. You can collect any combination of colors that you want. It's all about the symbols. The only reason the colors matter is when you play those cards to collect the tiles. And also, it's worth noting that the pictures on the cards are completely irrelevant. The pictures mean nothing. It's only the border color of the card that matters. When we first played the game, I had to explain to the players that the pictures on the cards are nothing. You know, one of the players thought we were supposed to be looking for or symbols on the board that match the card picture. So I could see where that might be a little confusing to a new player. So just reiterate those things and you'll be fine. 
So let's get into my rating and my first impressions review here. I want to start by talking about what I think is my favorite part of the game so far. And I touched on it quite a bit throughout the video, but let's circle back to that. And that is the idea of, you know, do you try to hurry up and build up unique symbols? Or do you try to get duplicate symbols and build up some Joker tiles, even though that goes against what you're trying to do to win the game? I also love the idea that they're Joker tiles, but they're not wild for your your set collection so you don't just place them on your board you know I feel like a lot of games would be like oh it's just a wild you can use it to count for any symbol on your board no this game does not do that this game says this is a joker to spend to the board to get a different tile and also to avoid paying your opponents which gives you a great incentive to collect duplicates so I just love when games sort of give you a way to win the game and then they give you this whole strategy that contradicts how you win the game but you kind of have to do that strategy to get a leg up on your opponent I think this game does that brilliantly Leo Colavini I think is a very underrated game designer and this game is another example of that I almost get angry when I look at the board game geek rating it's at a 5.7 right now and I can promise you that this is at least should be like a 6.5 to a 7 on that rating scale me personally I'm still in my uh, first impressions rating phase here um, I've only played three games of this so far but I'm rating this an eight and a half out of ten because I think this is an excellent little set collection game it's gritty it's mean it's brutal I really like this game uh, it's tense from start to finish uh, anytime you have a race involved in a game it adds that tension which I really like so far I've played it at three players Players and four players we've logged three plays so far and I really liked it at both player counts I can't say I liked one better than the other it definitely felt a little different like the three player game was a little more smooth and flowing whereas the four player game it was definitely more stressful more in your face gritty sort of grinded out to the finish type of a feel and I really liked it at four players because of that but that might not be for everybody and I'm curious to see how it changes at five players or two players make sure you let me know in the comments below if you've ever played this game you know what's your favorite player count how does the game change uh, at different player counts because right now like I said I've only played it three and four for now I'm really liking this game and I have to recommend it because we've had a lot of fun with it already and I've been thinking about it a lot this is one of those games that just kind of has stayed on my mind over the past week or two as we've been playing it and I'm just trying to think you know how can I do better next time but again first impressions rating eight and a half out of ten I love the table presence I love the player interaction I love the little subtleties in the game weighing all those little decisions like how far to move your boat how many cards do you really want to spend do you go for duplicates to get more jokers or do you go for more symbols to try to get a leg up on your opponent you could even try to rush the end of the game and just empty out a single column before your opponents even know what's going on you know there's all different ways to sort of go at each other in this game in all these little subtle ways you know it's not a direct take that type of game it's not a super cutthroat game but you can definitely get in each other's way block each other you can definitely gang up on the leader you know if you see somebody that's about to run out of tiles and finish up their board uh, you can bet everybody at the table is gonna be moving their little subs over and trying to block that player in maybe steal a tile that they need to finish their board or maybe just have enough boats there so they can't afford to pay cards out things like that and you know the game looks really cool I love seeing the submarines sort of working their way down to the deeper parts of the ocean I even think it's pretty neat you know how you have to pay the players that are directly above you because what that does is when you get down to those lower levels it makes those deeper treasures much harder to get because your chances are you're gonna have to pay more people more cards that are above you so thematically it kind of makes sense you know it's harder to get to those deeper treasures so all in all there's just a lot of things I like about this game I want to be careful that I don't overhype this because again this is first impressions so this game is still very new to me I'm still very excited about it you know I don't know how I will feel after 15 plays or so but chances are I think I'm gonna still like it because a it's a player driven game so the players drive the pace the setup is different every time as far as where those tiles are so it's all about how the players move and how you react to the other players so I like that part of it I think that will keep me coming back for more another thing I really like about it is it's pretty short it's like a 30 to 45 minute game you know borderline filler game here and I'm always happy to have a uh, you know just tense fun filler game that I 
can throw on the table, plays up to five players. A lot of things to like about this game, and there's not a lot that I didn't like other than I felt like a few turns I got saddled by my card draws. But at the same time, you know, you can position yourself accordingly and you really have a lot of freedom to move those little submarines in position. Uh, you have to think ahead, you know, sometimes you have to move those submarines back to the beginning of the board and think, okay, I'm just gonna run my big ship off the edge of the board, swap out some cards and wait till I get back around and start over. Sometimes you have to make that decision. So the luck of the draw didn't really bother me that much. Uh, it just felt like some turns I had to kind of waste and just hurry up and get back to the beginning of the board. Uh, but you just react to your card draws. It's not bad. So I like the game. I feel like uh, if you like the game Istanbul for some reason, I feel like you would like this game. I don't know why I kept getting some Istanbul vibes from this game. Uh, it's a very different game. Don't get me wrong. They're nothing alike other than you are racing you know in Istanbul you're racing to collect those rubies um, so it's a race but it's also that idea of when other players are on your spot you got to pay them so it kind of has that similar idea it uses grid movement so there are some similarities here and since Istanbul is in my top 25 of all time it's one of my favorite games um, I had to kind of throw in that comparison here because I really do think if you like Istanbul you'll probably like submarine so so if you like learning about these lesser known board games, make sure you click subscribe right here on YouTube. Make sure all your board gaming friends are subscribed as well because as long as my subscribers go up, I will continue posting videos like this on a regular basis. And uh, if you want to support the channel farther, there is a digital tip jar in the description below. It's just a PayPal link. You can donate any amount you like. You don't have to donate anything. I don't expect that. But if you want to, it's there and I really do appreciate that. It just kind of helps motivate me to make more content in the future. Future. You can also follow me over on Instagram at undiscovered underscore games. I post a lot of cool pictures and written reviews over there as well. All that stuff helps support the channel. And, you know, I just do this for fun. I'm not sponsored yet or anything like that. So just uh, any way you can help out, I really appreciate. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back with another episode here in a few weeks. I might be a little later than usual posting my next episode. I got some things coming up I got to deal with in the next couple weeks, but I'm going to try to get one out in two weeks. And if not, maybe three three weeks or something like that. So I will be back with another episode. Thanks for watching and I will see you then.